But I'm very pleased to welcome here in the studio Congressman Kevin McCarthy, the Republican leader in the House of Representatives, who is the likeliest man to become Speaker of the House in just a few weeks. And it is great to see you. Merry Christmas to you. Thanks for coming in. Merry Christmas to you. Thanks for having me. This is a great studio. All right. So let's talk about this date that I would imagine you have circled on your calendar. (laughs) Not Christmas, not Christmas Eve, January 3rd. It's going to be the Speaker vote. You have the overwhelming support of Republicans in the House to become the next Speaker. Republicans have somewhat narrowly won back the House of Representatives in the new Congress. But, as has been discussed endlessly in the media, there's this group of holdouts, sort of hardcore holdouts on sort of the right flank of the party. And they're saying, never, Kevin, we're not going to vote for him, period. And because of how close the margin is, I mean, they matter, right? So what's happening here? What's the end game for them, do you think? Well, hopefully the end game is everybody finds a way to get together. It's it's not just going to be speaker votes. It's how you're going to be governed for the next two years because any five members can stop anything. It doesn't matter where you fill out on the philosophical um, place out there. Um, Look, in the last two cycles, I've been leader for four years. The Senate lost seats. The governors have lost seats, Republican. The president lost. We have won both cycles. We won 13 seats last time, over nine this time. Our goal was to win the majority, stop the Biden agenda, and fire Nancy Pelosi. We achieved all three. Um, We're going to have to find a way that we all work together. It's probably a new train of thought for us. And, you know, they don't they don't they don't hand gavels out by size. You, you don't get a small, medium and large based upon the size of your majority. You get the exact same gavel. We'll have the exact same majority that the Democrats have today. Right. So we are the only ones standing in the way of more socialism. But it's not just as able to stand in the way we can govern. Now, a lot of things can happen on that very first day. We can get this. You can't do anything in, until you get the speaker vote. So you want to get the speaker vote. You got to put the rules package in. But then you start setting up the committees. And there's a lot of things. If you want to secure the border, you want to become energy independent, you want a parent's bill of rights, you want accountability. You can't put any subpoenas out. You can't uh, go to try to change a course of history when it comes to the border and others. And Well, the whole roadmap that you guys put out, you can't start to, down the road unless there's a Speaker of the House. You can't even swear in the members until the Speaker of the House decision is made. Which brings me back to the question, though, if you have these guys and they seem recalcitrant, they're dug in, they're saying they're not going to vote for you. It's like, OK, well, then what? Right. Because you're not going to have a Democratic speaker in a well, Republican House. You know, that was kind of already decided, though. This is this is the challenge. After the election, we come together in a conference and people run for who wants to be the speaker nominee. OK, you're in the majority. Uh, Dan Crenshaw yesterday on the show said it's like the primary within the, primary. the caucus. It's the primary within the caucus. I want 85 percent of the vote. Seems so, decisive. Yeah, so you seem like that would be over. Um, and what could happen here, though, too, if you haven't, we haven't witnessed this in quite some time, but in the past, every speaker's had some challenge, right? Inside that primary, I think, did Paul have 37 people vote against him? Pelosi had 40-some. And the, the last couple times, speaker races have been close, um, but never to the point that you didn't get it on the first round. Um, If that's not the case, nothing happens. Staff doesn't get hired. Committees don't start. You just go around this place. But I think really to the American public, it's going to weaken the Republicans. Sure. Are we prepared to start the first day? Do we look like we're beginning? Next year is a presidential year. We only have so much window to govern, to really lay out our agenda, to really change what the American people has asked us to. And if we spend more time on this, it's only going to bog us down. Are these guys asking you because i know you're having all these meetings constantly in your office you're just like you know cajoling and trying it's like let's come together let's be a happy family they're like well we'll meet with you but we're not that happy are they asking you for concessions can you give them certain things there's there's a number of things people want to see a different structure i'm all for that and in in a world where you only have a five seat majority everybody's got power Mm -hmm. so it's not like take for instance okay say five or six of them say they don't want to vote for me well, they don't get to det- they can determine something doesn't happen, but they don't determine something does happen. Those five, six don't get to pick the speaker. I got 200 are sitting with me. So who are they going to pick? Right. So we can sit there for a long period till everybody sees it. But do you want to air that out in the public? So really what people are talking about, how can we change the structure? We changed a lot of the rules. And 
I can't just determine what happens. The conference as a whole votes on these items. Uh, what I'm able to do is open the conference up so there's more debate, open the floor up so there's more opportunity, more amendments, more, more um, ability. And the one thing people had concerns in the past was everybody able to get on different committees. Well, I've proven that. And if it, it can't be a philosophical basis if you look from where I come from. But if, it, if it's a concern that people think are conservative, well, Jim Jordan supports me. Marjorie Green supports me. Donald Trump supports me. Um, so I don't know where this quite basis comes from. As people have offered different ideas, I've opened up the conference, and they, I think even people who have disagreements will say they've never had this type of debate before. They never had this openness before. And it's really something we're all going to have to learn how to do. It's not how a committee is going to craft a bill and then how do we get the bill to, um, to pass. It's everybody's got to be engaged in the bill from the very beginning. And we all got to have to support. We've got a big challenge with what Biden and the Democrats still control the Senate. Right. If we're divided, we're not going to hold it. We're either going to unite together or we're going to lose individually. And the Democrats were pretty good at uniting and unfortunately passing their stuff. Pelosi was as good at getting her people in line and whipping Very the good. votes and all of it. But already I'm starting to sort of think about this. And I'm not trying to be difficult, but it's like if the very first vote on the very first day is Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. and the Republicans can't get on the same page, and it's a big, drawn-out, messy thing, a lot of voters, Republican, Independents, Democrats, will say, how on earth are these guys going to pass anything if you've got a group of five right-wingers exactly. in this case or five moderates in that case, and everyone's off, you know, you're trying to herd cats, and they don't want to really be governed within the conference. How do the Republicans govern in the real sense? That's why I think at the end of the day— I hope all the members put people before politics, that they understand the voters have just entrusted us with some power. And why did they do that? They didn't like what was happening. They wanted to check and balance. But if they look at the very first day, we've had our primary. We've had our debate inside. People had an opportunity to run. It wasn't a close race. It was 85%. I received higher than in past races, even inside the Freedom Caucus, they have a rule that if 80 percent agree on some 100 percent have to vote that way. So we've passed every threshold possible. Um, there's nothing that I'm not saying. Somebody has an idea in a minute. Bring it forward. The conference as a whole gets to decide which direction we go. There's one part that they want to they want to bring back something that is called a motion to vacate where any one person can say, I want to throw the speaker out today. I've been very clear that Shift and Swalwell are not going to be on Intel. If you ever got the FBI briefing I did on Swalwell, you wouldn't let them on any committees. But why wouldn't he raise it every day and bog down our agenda? Mm. We have to be smart about this. Let's not turn the floor over to the Democrats. Let's govern the way we said we would govern. And yeah, one of the advantages of being the majority in the House is you really can control things unless you start making mistakes, allowing the other side to come in. And you guys wreaked a little havoc on the Democrats with motions to recommit until Pelosi just lowered Eliminated the boom them. on that. Yeah. yeah, and we were good at it. But we're watching Title 42 get lifted. 14,000 people a day come across, and we're going to sit and bicker over something we've already had a vote on instead of deciding the American public is more important. Especially as the very first thing. It's like a first impression. Yeah. The new Congress, people are watching. I do want to ask you, as you yes. said you've got, you know, now some power is back in the Republicans' hands. You're going to have probably this, this gavel at some point. You guys were expecting a lot more seats. And I know over on the Senate side, they were hoping to have a majority. Didn't happen. Why do you think, given all the circumstances in the country, which were so favorable, and you guys were ahead on the biggest issues, economy, crime, all of that, why wasn't, a bigger, why wasn't it a bigger night? Well, there's a number of things. I mean, and the one thing I will say, uh, in the last two cycles, they haven't been big for Republicans. Republicans have lost the last two cycles, but there's been one, one shining star through all that, the House. We were supposed to lose 15 seats the last time, but we beat 15 Democrats. And it was the first time since 94, not one incumbent loss. So and you swept all the toss-ups yeah. in 20. So I've only been leader four years, and I've, we've only won seats during the time of I've been a leader. I don't know historically when that's ever happened back-to-back, -back, but someone should look that up. But last cycle— we hope to win more. But if you look at the end of the day, it was a redistricting year. And there's a numerous things that have caused this. Um, if you look at the percentage of the overall vote, Republican, Democrat, we overwhelmingly won. 
but the margins narrow. So what that tells you for the next 10 years, you're not going to have big majorities. You're not going to have a 240-seat majority. It's going to be disproportionate. And if it becomes where it's even with the number of Republican Democrats, Republicans are going to be in the minority. So that's going to be different. We won in seats that people didn't think. We've won the last two cycles in California both times. We won in Oregon, which we haven't done in a long time. We won on the border, which we haven't done in a long time. We won in New York. We beat the DCCC chair. It hasn't happened in 42 years. We've won five seats that, that Biden won by more than 10 points. Mm-hmm. Three of those are in California. And think about what we were able to achieve there. So we've won in these really tough, tough seats. But in these closer ones, what really happened is there was an undecided block that normally you would assume if they were undecided right before the election day, they'd break our way. Mm -hmm. They didn't. They broke even. So I think the Supreme Court case, Dobbs, had something to do with that. If you looked at the Democrats, they did drive their turnout bigger than I thought they would. They had the youth vote even higher. Um, There's also a problem when you look at certain states that we won on and certain states we lost. In Pennsylvania, we didn't do well, even though we have a number of seats we came really close. We came close in Rhode Island and Connecticut and these others. Top of the ticket mattered. New Hampshire, you had a great governor. The Senate candidate didn't do well. In Pennsylvania, we had a governor candidate that never was on TV. So our candidates overperformed the top of the ticket, but they'd overperform the top of the ticket maybe eight points, but they needed to be 10 points. So that hurt. In Michigan... Well, in Michigan, John James did great. We picked up a seat, but we were hoping to pick up two. But the governor candidate there didn't perform as well, right? In Iowa, for the first time, I think, since 1954, we have all four seats. We picked up the other seat. So if you look in the last two cycles, we've won three seats in Iowa out of the four. Um, so there are really good places that we did well. Yeah, no, you zoom in on certain states, like New York is incredible. Yeah. And in other places where it didn't work out so well, and I know it's being dissected by all couple, the pundits. A couple things we did. We, we drove the campaigns everywhere. So we extended the race beyond that the Democrats can control. Um, that was providing resources. Our recruiting was excellent. When you look at when Myra Flores won in the special, Monica De La Cruz, Juan Siscamani in Tucson. Do you know Juan? Not personally. You, you should have Juan on here. You know, Juan immigrates from Mexico at age 11. His father, I believe, still drives a city bus in Tucson, Arizona. His wife is first generation, went to Stanford on academic. She actually grew up in my district, an ma- amazing woman as well. They have six kids. Juan is an economic advisor, but it's right there on the border. And when Juan won the primary, he calls me. You know, I call him congratulate. He calls me the next day. He goes, he's almost in tears. He goes, Kevin, you don't understand. The victory party was like one mile from the doctor's house. I used to go at age 14 with my father and mow the lawn and wash his car for extra money. And this country just gave me an opportunity. Mm. I mean, it gives you goosebumps. Um, if you look at, uh, in Oregon, um, Chavez de Reamer, Lori, amazing. We always talk about winning in Oregon. She just won in Oregon. Um, she's an amazing candidate. You, you look at Mike, no, you've got some you very compelling Lauren. people coming through. You, you look at John James. Here's John James, Wesley Hunt in Texas. You know what those both have in common? They both went to West Point and both were helicopter pilots. They also both happen to be African-American. Um, we have elected more black Republicans since, since, um, since back in the 1870s. We have elected the most Hispanic Republicans in this cycle. Um, when, when I first came in as leader, um, we had almost some of the smallest numbers of women Republicans. In. We, we, we've been able to expand. So th- there are certain really parts that have been done really well for us, but we haven't got all the way. Yeah. No, so there's, the look, party there's, itself has There's to some get wins. Back. We're almost up on a break, so I just okay. have to jump in. But some of the personalities coming in are very impressive. Obviously, my biggest thing is no matter what the margin is, you've got to win the House because you've got to put an end to this Biden agenda. Just, you know, nonstop Democrats steamrolling. That will be over thank God, next year. The question is, how much can House Republicans govern? Step one is selecting a speaker. And are you confident very quickly, 10 seconds, that you will be the next speaker of the House? Yes. I have a, look, I've been leader for four years. All we've done was win. Um, and, recru- you won, and you won 85% of the caucus. Like, I mean, that and, should and, be a, and to we, me. And we recruited the best candidates. The party is more expanded in places we've never been before. We've won in places we haven't won in years. The resources. Also, you got to raise the money. Half a billion dollars. No one's ever—and what's helped it to expand. If that's not good enough 
to be able to have the opportunity to be speaker, then what is? If hard work no longer matters, what will? January 3rd is the big day. We'll see what happens. Kevin McCarthy, the current House Republican leader, and very well could become the Speaker of the House in a matter of weeks. It's great to see you face-to-face. Thanks for coming in. Merry Christmas, and we'll catch up after early January. How about that? Thank you. Merry Christmas to all, and uh, happy Hanukkah.